Okay, so you can imagine that Miss Emily, Emily Grierson, the daughter of Mr. Grierson, uh, would have had a lot of restrictions uh, placed on her as this young woman of a certain uh, class in society. Um, so there are certain rules uh, that go along with being um, a proper Southern woman. Uh, so she would have, you know, there are certain things that you can think about, you know, you wouldn't probably, uh, you, you wouldn't be allowed to be seen with a young man on your own. You'd have to have a chaperone in a lot of cases, or um, you'd have to always, you know, wear gloves in public uh, or something like that, or you would never be seen talking to uh, a man who, um, you know, was, had a bad reputation or, uh, if you were seen with somebody uh, who you were, you know, a, a man seen together, it meant something. Uh, people would start gossiping about you uh, and there would be sort of rumors spread about you. Uh, so there was a lot of sort of restrictions or expectations put on a young woman in the situation. And she had to sort of maintain a sense of very, you know, had to be very proper, a certain level of decorum that goes along with it. So I sort of feel bad for Emily for that reason because she does suffer from a lot of social restrictions. So I think we are meant to feel rather, you know, a, f a feeling of empathy or pity for uh, Emily in this story. And it'll become, you know, more difficult to feel sorry for as we see her mental decline. And we'll talk more about that uh, because there is a sort of shocking twist to the story. Um, but when we learn about Miss uh, Emily's uh, sort of growing up under her father, uh, we learn sort of the extent of her life under this kind of oppressive, um, restrictive lifestyle. And it turns out that, you know, she was, um, her father, when her father died, uh, she was, um, she struggled with it a lot because, you know, to her, her father was everything. He, you know, ruled the household. She was, you know, as a young woman, she would be, you know, belong to her father until the day that she was married. Um, so her whole life sort of is revolving around the men in her life who kind of control her uh, situation. Um, so he has really his thumb over Emily all through this period of time when she was courting and dating. Um, so it ends up that she becomes... Uh, a spinster, basically, uh, is what they would have been called. Um, but a woman who was not married uh, by the time she was 30 uh, would be sort of considered over the hill, um, unmarriable, and, um, you know, it, your options, your opportunities in life start dwindling rapidly once you're, you know, past the age of 25, really, uh, in this situation. Obviously, times have changed, and you know, you can be 30 years old, 35 years old, 40, 45, uh, single, and, you know, no one's going to judge you uh, too harshly, at least. Um, but in this society, everybody would be, you know, the rumors would be flying if you were, you know, still single at 20, 25, you know, people would feel sorry for you that you didn't marry and you won't have children and all that stuff like that. So there's a lot of judgment and and really harsh criticism um, of others. Uh, so at the time uh, when her father dies, uh, we learn that um, the rest of Jefferson starts feeling sorry for her. And this is on page 158. Um, so that was when people had begun to feel really sorry for her. People in our town remember how old lady Wyatt, her great aunt, had gone completely crazy at last believed that the Grierson's held themselves a little too high for what they really were. None of the young men were quite good enough for Miss Emily and such. We had long thought of them as a tableau. Miss Emily, a slender figure in white in the background, her father, a spraddling silhouette in the foreground, his back to her and clutching a horsewhip, the two of them framed by the back flung front door. So when she got to be 30 and was still single, we weren't exactly, or we weren't pleased exactly, but vindicated. Even with insanity in the family, she wouldn't have turned down all those chances if they had really materialized. Uh, when her father died, it got about the house was all that was left to her, and in a way, people were glad. At last, um, they could pity Miss Emily. Being left alone and a pauper, she had become humanized. 
Now she too would know the old thrill and the old despair of a penny more or less. The day after his death, all the ladies prepared to call at the house and offer condole condolence and aid, as is our custom. Miss Emily met them at the door, dressed as usual and with no trace of grief on her face. She told them that her father was not dead. She did that for three days, with the ministers calling on her and the doctors trying to persuade her to let them dispose of her, the body. Just as they were about to resort to law and force, she broke down and they buried her father quickly. We did not say then she was crazy. We believed she had to do that. We remembered all the young men her father had driven away, and we knew that with nothing left, she would have to cling to that which had robbed her, as people will. So we that's a lot of information to sort of soak in about Emily's uh, life. Um, but we get a sense in that uh, sort of short paragraph uh, or a couple of paragraphs that she had grown up in a very kind of restricted lifestyle and that one image that we get of her and her father um, so this idea that um, there was this painting a tableau a picture of Emily and her father uh, Miss Emily a slender figure in white in the background um, figure of white uh, might be you know a symbol of innocence beauty purity a young woman uh, wearing white and then her father is in the foreground so he's in the front of this tableau and his back is to her and he's clutching a horse whip so a very kind of menacing uh, image of her father there uh, you know holding a whip um, very uh, kind of oppressive strong uh, aggressive image of her father and then um, we learn that she's also, you know, she's no longer a young woman, uh, so she's become, uh, you know, when she turns 30, everyone starts feeling, you know, a little bit, you know, they feel almost happy that bad stuff has happened to her because they always thought that the Grierson's had held their, held themselves a little too high and mighty, maybe a little too snobby or, um, you know, they just felt they had like, you know, an air of arrogance about them or pretension. Uh, so they wanted to see them fail in some way, humanize Miss Emily. So she just becomes a regular person. Uh, but they also feel kind of sorry for her uh, because she's left penniless uh, from her father. All she has is the house um, and that's it. So her father dies. They're no longer wealthy. Um, she's a pauper, right? Poor and all she has is the house left um, and then this detail about what she does with her father's body after he dies is important as well uh, so he dies and she clings to the body and they have to actually come knock on her door to retrieve the body um, because she's in denial so she denies he's dead and clings to him um, and they eventually, after three days, she breaks down in tears and lets them take away her father's body. Um, and they, they say, well, we didn't think she was crazy at that point, but who knows, they think she's crazy later on, maybe. Um, uh, we believe she had to do that. We remembered all the young men her father had driven away. So that's another clue that, you know, that image of her father with the horse whip is also a very terrifying image of how he kind of controlled her life chased away any young man because he thought they were all not good enough for the high and mighty Grierson family. Um, and if she did have marriage proposals, they all kind of faded away uh, or they didn't really materialize. Um, so they all, like the townspeople, who is our kind of narrator for these events, um, they all agree that, you know, she had to cling to this man, her father, who also had robbed her of her chance for happiness um, so they cha he chased away any chance she had of marrying and having a happy life uh, full of love um, so she cling to her father because as a young woman you either really have your father you're under his household until you marry and if she doesn't have her father and she doesn't have a husband then she's really kind of on her own um, and people start to feel you know sorry for her at that point um, so this is her predicament. Um, we, you know, I think we tend to feel sorry for her because she lost an opportunity, was prevented from experiencing a lot of love um, and that normal 
sort of pattern of courtship and then marriage. Her father had sort of uh, blocked her from that life. Uh, so she clings to him uh, because that's all she has in life. She doesn't have wealth anymore. Um, she's, you know, no longer of high status, really. Uh, she's become humanized uh, in her sort of poverty. So we do feel sorry for her at that point. So uh, soon after that, uh, the next time we see Emily, she cuts her hair. So uh, she, her father dies, and then she was sick for a long time, it says, this is page 158. Um, so she looked a lot, very girlish again. And then uh, that summer, uh, another man appears in her life, Homer Barron. Um, and Homer Barron is a northerner. Um, so as she's a southern belle, he's a northerner. Uh, if you know anything about, you know, civil war, it was the north versus the south. Uh, the North wanted, you know, to abolish slavery. The South wanted to keep slavery. Uh, so they are in conflict, or they used to be in conflict, but nowadays, you know, you, we hope that those issues will be passed by now. But um, anyway, Homer Barron comes into town. Uh, he works construction, and uh, he's kind of a more, you know, of a different class than Emily. She's more aristocratic. He's more kind of working class or blue collar or whatever you want to, he's a laborer or more rugged. Um, and he talks, you know, quite loudly and boisterous and um, he's, you know, a charismatic uh, character around town. Um, and, you know, he, they start being seen together in public. Um, so it's obviously becomes kind of, they, their relationship is blossoming under the uh, sort of critical eye of all the townspeople who love to gossip about the Grierson's. Um, and even though M Miss Emily is no longer sort of the high and mighty uh, Grierson family, she's now been humanized, they still love to gossip about her. So our narrator in the story is sort of like the townspeople collectively wondering and characterizing Emily throughout her life. Um, so we sort of get this narrator that um, is sort of giving us clues about um, how Emily was perceived by the public eye, very scrutinized and um, a lot of, you know, gossip and uh, hearsay about what happens or what she was doing behind closed doors. Um, so at first the townspeople uh, did not really think too fondly of this relationship that was blossoming between Homer Barron and Miss Emily because uh, first they view it from kind of an old-fashioned perspective, a traditional perspective that said, oh, well, he's not, you know, he's not a suitable person for a woman of her status or from her family background. Um, she, she couldn't possibly actually want to marry this guy. Um, he's not suitable. He's a day laborer. Uh, and she's restricted by this noblesse oblige, right, which I talked about. So um, a real lady would never, you know, be seen with somebody as rough and rugged around the edges and also a northerner um, like Homer Barron. So at first they sort of think that, you know, they're a mismatched couple, that it's an inappropriate pairing, that you know, she's embarrassing her family by even being seen with Homer Barron. So even though her father has died, it's now the townsfolk that are kind of judging her and, you know, forcing her to sort of, you know, just judging her relationship with Homer Barron. So it's her one, you know, one of her last chances that she might have for a marriage or happiness or whatever she wants in life. And here she is being scrutinized um, by society. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes really unfair, the situation for her, and you do feel sort of sorry for her. And the townspeople do kind of go back and forth, whether they feel sorry for her, whether they're judging her. Uh, they're really sort of wishy-washy or go back and forth about uh, their feelings for her. Um, and then they said on page 159, uh, the townsfolk say, poor Emily, her kinsfolk should call or should come to her. Um, and then they 
it's they'll eventually call her cousins uh from you know family relations to come visit and sort of put pressure on Emily and Homer Baron um because it's not appropriate for a woman an unmarried woman uh to be seen in public with somebody who you know if they're not engaged or if there's you know no chaperone or uh, all these things then rumors start to be uh, spread and you can become easily a fallen woman a woman of you know bad reputation uh, if you allow that to get sort of out of hand I guess or allow society to judge you that way um, but she seems pretty happily happy with Homer Baron um, but she and they say she carried her head high even when we believe she had fallen so her reputation had sort of taken a hit at that point um, she had she's become a kind of fallen woman uh, in the sense that her reputation as this proper you know virginal uh, young woman has maybe been stained or tarnished uh, with her relationship with Homer Baron she had lost a little bit of her uh, you know status or dignity I guess uh, in the eyes of the townsfolk who constantly judge her and um, and then we uh, figure out that, so they do send for her cousins eventually. And where is that? So you, so you have to sort of jump back and forth to get the story uh, in order. So that's one of the tricky things is like trying to figure out how all these events play out um, in chronological order. So Miss Emily's relationship with Homer Baron um, isn't progressing the way that everybody thinks it's going to so at first when they were seen together everybody was sort of gossiping about them saying oh they're not suitable but then eventually they're saying uh, they thought you know maybe they'll maybe she'll marry him and you know at least she'll have you know a chance of you know some kind of happy life and then eventually it kind of drags on their relationship doesn't seem to be going anywhere and the townspeople are starting to say oh well maybe she'll persuade him yet uh, because there are sort of, you know, ideas about Homer uh, Baron, and he uh, has remarked uh, that he uh, is not a marrying man. And this is a part of the story that students always sort of cling on to, and they want to know, is Homer Baron gay then? Um, is that what the story is saying? So it's kind of ambiguous, like it doesn't really say, you know, well, it says, um, I'll read you the actual quote here. So on page 160... Uh, so we had, when she had first begun to be seen with Homer Baron, we had said she will marry him. Then we said she will persuade him yet, because Homer himself had remarked he liked men and it was known that he drank with the younger men in the Elks Club, that he was not a marrying man. Later we said poor Emily behind the jalousies as they passed on Sunday afternoon in the glittering buggy, Miss Emily with her head high and Homer Baron with his hat cocked and a cigar in his teeth reins and whip in a yellow glove. Uh, then some of the ladies began to say it was a disgrace to the town and a bad example to the young people. Um, so they start interfering. But in that part we do get this uh, information about Homer Baron that maybe he's not a marrying type of man. Like he's maybe one of these guys who's, you know, I guess nowadays we would think of them as, you know, a bachelor for life. Uh, maybe more of a playboy. Um, or maybe it's implying that he actually is gay. So, I don't know. You could interpret it in whichever way you want. But it might have had a different connotation in 1930 when it was written than we sort of read it now. So, you do have to kind of understand some of the ambiguity of uh, what um, Faulkner is saying about Homer Baron in that line. Um, so, but regardless, he's not going to marry Miss Emily. That's not going to be something, you know, that's not something he wants in life, um, even if she maybe wants that. Uh, so uh, there's a kind of unreciprocal relationship. It's not equal. Um, he doesn't maybe return the feelings that she has for him. Uh, and then all the townsfolk, the ladies in town start you know, thinking that this relationship is disgraceful, that they're parading around in public together, but they're not engaged uh, or they're not married. Um, so 
The minister's wife uh, writes to Miss Emily's relations, the cousins that come from Alabama, and these cousins are there to sort of put some pressure on these two uh, to make this thing official, to get them married, and then at least it won't be, you know, a, you know, a bad, you know, rep won't ruin their, her reputation any further um, if she's at least marries this guy. Uh, so there's that. And then um, Miss Emily ends up, so her cousins are at her house. And then uh, at first nothing happened. And then it says, then we were sure that they were going to be married. We learned that Miss Emily had been to the jewelers and ordered a man's toilet set in silver with the letters HB on each, each piece. So she buys a kind of um, monographed um, toilet set. So maybe like a hairbrush, a comb, and a razor or something like that. So something official for a man, you know, your husband that you might buy. Uh, and then two days later, we learned that she had bought a complete outfit of men's clothing, including a nightshirt, and we said they are married. We were really glad. We were glad because the two female cousins were even more Grierson than Miss Emily had ever been. So to be Grierson in this uh, context is to be, you know, ultra snobby, pretentious, and uh, awful, I guess, <laughs> snobby or, you know, high and mighty. Uh, so the female cousins aren't, you know, they're, the rest of the town don't like the female cousins um, and they want to sort of chase them away. Um, but they are expecting now that the couple will for sure get married because Miss Emily had bought this night shirt and uh, the monographed um, toilet set, all for Homer Baron. And then the cousins were there putting pressure on them. And then uh, eventually uh, it says, so we were not surprised when Homer Barron, uh, the streets had been finished sometime since, uh, was gone. He, we were a little disappointed that there was not a public blowing off, but we believed that he had gone on to prepare for Miss Emily's coming or to give her a chance to get rid of the cousins. Uh, by that time, it was a cabal and we were all Miss Emily's allies to help circumvent the cousins. Sure enough, after another week, they departed, and as we expected all along, within three days, Homer Barron was back in town. Uh, and that was the last we saw of Homer Barron and of Miss Emily for some time. So this is kind of part of the mystery. Um, so they see Homer Barron one last time return uh, once the cousins are gone, and that's the last time we see uh, Homer Barron in Miss Emily's house. So interesting uh, mystery. This is the enigma, the puzzle uh, that is Miss Emily. Um, but there's a clue to what happens there. And it happens, we get this information earlier on. Uh, so on page, here we are. Uh, so we have, uh, oh yeah, so on page 159, um, um, so we, on page 159, we get the information that, uh, at a certain point, so when the cousins were there, uh, she, Miss Emily had actually gone to the drugstore, uh, to ask for arsenic. Uh, so this is on one, 159. Uh, so she carried her head high enough, even when we believed she had fallen, it was as if she demanded more than ever the recognition of her dignity as the last Grierson, as if, she, as if that wanted the touch of earthliness to reaffirm her imperviousness. Like when she bought the rat poison, the arsenic, that was over a year after they had begun to say poor Emily and while the two female cousins were visiting her. So at the same time that the cousins were there, she goes out and buys the arsenic uh, and then she goes to the druggist and says, I want some poison, she said to the druggist. She was over 30 then, still a slight woman, though thinner than usual, with cold, haunty black eyes and a face, the flesh of which was strained across the temples and about the eye sockets. As you can imagine, a lighthouse keeper's face ought to look. I want some poison, she said. Uh, so she's just sort of described as this, you know, cold, haunty black eyes and a face uh, stretched over the eye sockets. Interesting depiction. She's very thin at this point, um, but over 30, so she's no, no longer a young woman, and here she is buying arsenic. So it's kind of part of the mystery. Why is she buying this arsenic? 
what's she going to do with it? Uh, and then um, that's pretty much uh, what the druggist asks her. Um, and uh, he says, uh, that'll kill anything up to an elephant, but, but what you want, uh, arsenic. Uh, is that a good one? Is arsenic? Yes, ma'am. That's what you want. And then she says, um, uh, or he asks, if that's what you want, but the law requires you tell what you're going to use it for. Miss Emily just stared at him, her head tilted back in order to look him eye for eye. And then uh, on the package she brings home, it says four rats. Uh, so she has this arsenic uh, at the same time that her cousins are there putting pressure on her and Homer Baron to marry. The cousins leave are chased out of town because the townspeople all gather together and get the Grierson's out of there. Um, and then Miss Emily, they see Homer Baron return one last time through the back tour. And then after that, he's never heard of again. So this mystery around Homer Baron's um, disappearance is kind of not revealed until the very end of the story. Uh, but before that, we get, you know, sort of the stages of her growing old. Um, she, you know, becomes more and more reclusive, more isolated from the rest of the town. Uh, she becomes, you know, aged. Uh, she ages uh, quite a lot over the years. Um, and uh, at that point, so... Um, and then uh, it says, so at, this is on page 160 again. Um, that, and that was the last we saw of Homer Barron and of Miss Emily for some time. Uh, the Negro Man, her uh, gardener slash cook slash, you know, the, the you know, family uh, sort of caretaker who looks after her house, uh, went in and out with the market basket, but the only, but the front door remained closed. Now and then we would see her at the window for a moment as the men did that night when they sprinkled the lime but for almost six months she did not appear on the streets. So that part about the men sprinkling the lime, uh, that's another kind of event uh, that happens immediately after um, Homer Barron's disappearance. Um, and in that case, they sprinkled lime all around her house because there was this smell emanating from the Grierson house and there was a lot of complaints and somebody had to do something about it. So all the aldermen of the town, so like the important sort of government or uh, citizens, I guess, um, they sort of get together with the judge and they uh, decide that they have to confront this smell uh, themselves. And rather than, you know, confront Emily herself, they start, they take it into their own, own hands and uh, sprinkle lime all around her basement and all the outside buildings uh, in her cellar door. So maybe the, her, they open up her basement um, and start putting lime there. And if you don't know what lime is, I guess it would sort of be something that would um, be used to get rid of, you know, something smelly or decayed, uh, rotten, and, you know, something, you know, smells to high heavens in Miss Emily Grierson's house and they need to get rid of the smell so they sprinkle this uh, stuff all over it and then after that after a week or two the smell went away um, so at that time they saw Miss Emily in the in the window of her house just her silhouette there while they sprinkled this lime all around her house and then after that she kind of disappears uh, for quite a while um, you know very much more isolated than she used to be. So we'll see her sort of become more and more uh, secluded and uh, the object of kind of secrecy and mystery in Jefferson as time goes on.